Now, the president has been meeting with the National House of Chiefs in Menshia. In that meeting, the president said the statement that he is putting his presidency on the line in the fight against Galamse is nothing but the truth. He asked for the exclusion of partisan politics from the fight against illegal mining. The, the president of the house, when I was greeting him, told me he thought that I would be in Kente to come and address the National House of Chiefs today. But I told him that I, there was no Kente of mine that could match up to the Kente of the members of the National House. So I thought it would be safer to be in a suit. <laughs> I'm grateful to the president of the National House of Chiefs, the forward thinking of my enemy of Sefian Riaso, Jiahoho, Yao JB II, for so readily agreeing to my respectful request to meet with you this morning. And I'm further grateful that at such relatively short notice, so many of you are distinguished traditional rulers from the various parts of our nation have found it possible to be here this morning to meet with you, to meet with me. I ask for this meeting because I want to speak to you about a matter of great national importance, and that is this vexed issue of Galamse. President and members of the National House of Chiefs, you have been for centuries the custodians and owners of the lands of our nation. Today, between you and I, as the President of the Republic, we are responsible for the management of all lands in Ghana. Indeed, 80% of the lands in this country continue to be under your custody, much of it having been acquired through the blood and sacrifices of your ancestors. The remainder of 20%, which I hold in trust for the people of Ghana, derives from state acquisition from you. What this means is that ultimately, the welfare of the state of the lands is our joint responsibility. Although by statute, the minerals in the soil belong to the president in trust for the people. Historically, we discharge that responsibility well. Even though for centuries we have been a mining nation, mining did not pose a threat to the health of our environment and water bodies. The rules that you put in place for mining ensure that the sanctity of our lands remained intact and our water bodies remained unpolluted. Tragically, in the modern era, that is no longer the case. And that is why I've come to you today to talk about how together we can repair this dramatic situation. Since I took office on 7th January 2017, nearly six years ago, I have made it a central feature of my presidency to lead in the efforts to rid our country of this madness, which we all now call Galamse. Indeed, it was an important aspect of my inaugural address of that day. It has not been easy. It has not been popular. And we have not got the immediate results that I was looking for. Indeed, in the last elections of 2020, my stance on the issue cost my party and I significant losses in the mining community. It turned out that my statement that I was putting my presidency on the line in the fight against Galance was neither bombast nor recklessness. 
It was the simple truth. We have tried many initiatives, including that of the community mining scheme and the establishment of a new legal regime for dealing with the perpetrators of this phenomenon, which has imposed severe sanctions on those Ghanaians and foreigners convicted of illegal mining. Still, we have not won the fight. It is obvious that if we are to win the fight, you and I have to take the lead to collaborate closely to do so. And that is why I'm here today. After our meeting, I'll also be meeting with the other half of local government, the Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives, and the 90 Metropolitan, Municipal and District areas across the country where mining activities take place to seek their active collaboration too. There are many requests I intend to make of you in the closed door session of our meeting. But one of the most significant, which I have to state now, is to seek your assistance to take partisan political interests out of the fight against Galamse. It can only succeed if it is a truly national battle, which no one seeks to exploit for political gain, as we saw in the last election. The progress of our country depends on all of us, all citizens of Ghana, all fellow Ghanaians, pulling together to defeat this existential threat to our future. I've said it before, we are not against mining. But we cannot accept mining in a manner that risks destroying our country. Our nation has always been a mining nation. Indeed, in the 15th century, when the first Europeans, the Portuguese, came to our shores, they called the first European-influenced town El Mina, meaning the mine in Portuguese, because from their ships, as they approached our shores, that is the activity they saw our people engaged in. It is not surprising that in colonial times we are called the Gold Coast. I ask all of you to join hands with me in the fight against illegal mining in order to bring an end to the devastation of our landscape and the pollution of our water bodies. We have to win that fight to keep our environment clean and protect our heritage for our descendants, as you did so well in the past. I'd like, therefore, to conclude these introductory remarks and ask the media to excuse us to play you a short video to indicate the nature of the problem. After the after the after the after the uh, the video. Oh, I said the video. After the video. Thank you. So that's the president's opening remarks at the meeting with the National House of Chiefs. But this meeting and this reaction is coming after public outcry since Joy News' uh, latest expose titled Destruction for Gold put together by my colleague Erastos Asaridonko. If you missed the photo documentary, here is an asset. On August 17th this year, the Minerals Commission in a press release stated that the Lands Minister has not issued any license for minerals prospecting in any forest reserve. The release signed by Chief Executive Officer of the Commission, Martin Aisi, referred to a letter by Akonta Mining Limited dated August 8, 2022, which was an application for an entry permit to enter the Tanonimre Forest Reserve at Samraboy in the Western Region. 
the release said the application must be processed, quote, subject to the Honorable Minister of Lands and Natural Resources Directive on Mining in Forest Reserve. But even before the Lands Ministry would indicate publicly its position on the application, our checks indicate active mining in the Tanonimri Forest Reserve. A visit to the forest revealed large portions of the reserve already mined and degraded. This drone footage, taken few days ago, shows active mining linked to Akunta Mining Limited under the protection of armed personnel. The forest reserve is being destroyed with impunity even at the time of airing this report. We are here at uh, this time. Uh, Totokro, the hot duties and there are some policemen and uh, media be here. Despite Love News' expose on military personnel protecting miners in the Odaho section of the Apamprama Forest Reserve, security personnel are still providing protection for miners who are pillaging the reserve currently as corroborated by the Mentiahene of Bekwai, Nanakusi Frimpong Kotobre. My district is Amansa Central. That is where I have my cuckoo farm. In that area, there's a forest called Kobo Forest. The forest is guarded by soldiers as people mine inside the forest. I had a confrontation with the soldiers. They said they are on duty. What kind of duty is being held in the forest? Ministers and people in government are the ones protecting them. Because I can't hire military men, if I could, I would ask them to accompany me to the farm to weed. You can join in the conversation around Galamse with the hashtag no to Galamse. We are available on all our social media platforms. Let's talk about Galamse to make sure we are finding a way to dealing with it. Now, away from that, hundreds of persons living in the Wejagbai municipality were forced to spend the night outside their homes after water levels that rose to deadly height. Residents say the flooding was caused by a spillage of excess water from the Weja Dam. Security agencies worked throughout the night in the dark to rescue persons trapped in their homes as the affected communities have been without power for close to 24 hours. I have been engaging some affected persons who are calling for immediate uh, intervention from government in Ashalaja. So this is the level of the water after the third day of flooding, uh, you know, in, in this place. And from where I am, I can still see flood waters up onto that point. I'm being told by a resident here that the distance between this place and the river could be more than three kilometers. Yet, it has been able to overflow its banks onto this place. And for three days, the water, even though it has receded, is close to my knee. It tells you uh, that the first second day of the flooding was really a difficult period for people who live here. Now, um, I have with me one of the uh, residents of this area. Let me try and gauge the mood, uh, you know, of uh, the community the day it happened. Chief, at saying, Okay. Okay. Almost a moko, a salaja, crunumaba, bomb one sam babu. And a pena, 
ubinu ba adi kenki ba kuni intina ba kuwa kodi brei wa se omo sa kwaba vita na pani na yase ngoshi inti yadasu umisa inti au hinfa na yadasi sia oh mida mida kontina mida mire kontina mene mire mene ba yada kontina yada ni de inti mene mune na what did you say? Watch now, watch now. But tomorrow, dema. Watch now. Come for me, me need to do that. But just one week time. I am saying I hope I dry. What we far, baby? But just say. When we are far, baby, I am more. But my reason, I am not a bit afford. But a bit, a bit also. Ni 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 na na to me afford sir. But a bit afford. But a bit also, a bit also. So um, what he is basically saying is that uh, you know that day when the incident happened, you 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 cannot behold the number of people who are carrying their belongings, including mattresses, out of this place. It looked as though there was a war in this place, and people were fleeing from the war. Um, he tells me that. Uh, uh, now he and his family have moved from this place and they are lodging in his wife's container uh, which is a store close to the roadside he says that the nadmo were here today to uh, give some food to the people who were affected but when they came for them and said they were going to give them a place of shelter they said they were going to return that's not more officials but they uh, have not returned till today um, they don't know when they will, but he expects that the water will fully recede depending on where you are, maybe in a week's time. That's when he and his family can have access to their home again. I'm surprised okay. at the moment because we have never experienced such before. It does come every year, but then it doesn't exceed where we are. Mm. Yes, but then as at Saturday, Sunday, and today. Today it's even better. Because yesterday, when Nadmo came to rescue us, they had to park their car over here and then mm. for us to come and join. Okay. Yeah. Right now, my books and my certificates, they are all soaked in the water mm. because we hanged it up there, but I don't know how it fell in the water. And then, mm. yes, my, my daughter's uniforms, her school bags, her books, they are all swimming in the water. So what we had to do is just to lock the door so that it wouldn't bring the our belongings outside. Yes, so it would just be swimming. Mm. Yes, so we'd wait so it subsides and then we go to see what we have left in the house. So let's cross over live now to my colleague who has been covering this disaster since yesterday. He uh, is currently in Tetegu covering how people are, you know, uh, moving away from the disaster zone to higher height. Maxwell Agbaba is still there for us. Let's join in now. All right, so um, we'll, we'll still take, it, take you live to Maxwell Agbaba, who is in Tetegu now. It's one of the areas uh, affected by the flooding as a result of the opening of the uh, or spillage of water from the Wager Dam. Uh, this morning when we were there, you could see some very moving scenes of people stuck in their homes, not able to move outside as a result of the flood waters. Other people who were trying to move uh, but we're recounting how it's been difficult for them to, uh, for their children to go to school. Other people said it was even difficult to be getting uh, food for them to eat. But uh, we'll bring you, we'll go join Maxwell Agaba live later on. But for now, um, he spent yesterday um, joining security forces on how they could rescue people and has come through with this report. Coming to you from... Um we are coming to you from Tetegu. So this is the Tetegu community itself. And we are in this canoe. We're trying to take you around so you can have a better view of what is happening. Um, the gentleman here um, is from the National Disaster Management Organization. From, he's actually from the Marine Police. And uh, we're lucky to have him around here. He's going to make sure that we are safe um, on this canoe. You can see there, um, you can see there's some people in that in that pub this is where a lot of the community people 
on a normal day would go and sit, have drinks, have conversations among themselves. Um, but that is not the case today. Many of them have had reason um, to move to a higher ground. And this is the Tetegu community. You can see that structure um, over there partially um, submerged. This shop, for instance, this is, this is a salon, um, amazing beauty. You can see closed, the gates to this closed. This is someone's residence. This is, a, this is someone's residence. I'm told all the people who live here have been forced to move away from um, this place. We are told that more speedboats um, are coming in. The National Disaster Management Organization is currently um, further, further in there um, trying to rescue um, more people who've been trapped um, in their homes, who have not been able to step out from their homes since, um, since yesterday. I was informed that there's a currently a municipal security meeting um, underway trying to get relief um, for all of these persons um, who have been affected. You can see these people seated here. And this is the only dry land that they find on their compound um, today. And that has been the case um, since yesterday. Um, so you, there's a television, television set there on that canoe. You can see that mattress also going to be transported to a dry land. The entire Tetegu community is covered with water. And as I speak to you, school is not in session. School is not in session. All the schools have closed. You can see the intensity of that, of the water on the other side. And you can see people moving. I want my camera technician to pan so you can see that. The intensity of the water, uh, the, the current sometimes gets very um, intense. And this covers a wide area, swathes of land underwater. You can see the Apostolic Church, Ghana, Hallelujah, Assembly. So schools are affected, churches are affected, um, pubs are affected. The entire community has been affected by this, um, this flood. And we, you can see from up there, 200 meters, 500 meters away, you can see people walking, wading through um, the flat water to the other end. Let's see if we can... Cut. Another man there also moving to the dry land with a canoe. That you can only move through this community now um, in the canoe. This is the only means of transportation now. You cannot go around um, with your vehicle. No, you can't do that. Even for four-wheel drives, it is extremely, extremely um, difficult. You can see the other people up there on the roof. So that's my colleague Maxwell Agbagba live from the Tetegu community. Now, the Public Utility Regulatory Commission is directing the Electricity Company of Ghana to compensate its customers affected by its nationwide system shutdown. Hundreds of customers experienced challenges purchasing power at various vending centers. As a result of the system challenge, management of ECG yesterday said it has faced the vending challenges, but some customers have been demanding compensation for their losses. Let me share with you the full detail of the PRC statement. It said the commission writes in respect of the vending failure which occurred in ECG's uh, uh, prepayment system across the country from September 2022 to early October 2022. In light of the breach of ECG's statutory obligation, specifically sections 11 and 12, 1 and 2 of the Public Utilities Act 1997, Act 538 and Regulations 41 and 45 of the Public Utilities Regulatory Commissions, that's Consumer Service Regulations 2022, LI2413, the Commission hereby orders ECG to pay compensation to the affected customers in accordance with the attached order. This is in compliance with the law and a demonstration of good customer service. You may contact the undersigned for any clarification you may require.
details of that order. One, the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission's that's PRC Commission has noted a widespread system failure in the prepayment meter vending systems of the Electricity Company of Ghana in various locations and around the country, which was confirmed in a press release issued by ECG. Two, among others, the law imposes a duty on public utilities to provide safe, adequate, efficient, reasonable, and non-discriminatory services. Now, three, the law also mandates the commission to impose compensation orders, among other penalties, on public utilities for failure to comply with their legal obligations. Four, in view of the extent of inconvenience occasioned by the failures with the ECG prepayment meter system, the commission has determined that ECG shall pay compensation to all its affected customers. Now, uh, again, ECG is hereby ordered to compensate each affected customer for loss suffered as uh, a show of responsive customer service as follows. For residential, that's lifeline uh, penalty units, it doesn't apply to you. Now, for residential, 10 penalty unit uh, equivalent uh, uh, to 15 Ghana cities. Non-residential, uh, 20 penalty unit equivalent to 120 Ghana cities. For commercial purposes, 40 penalty unit equivalent to four, uh, 240 cities. For industrial, 100 penalty unit equivalent to 1,200 Ghana cities. Now, uh, point five it says ECG shall additionally adopt immediate measures to increase staff output and responsiveness to customers, including extension of working hours at all affected locations to 8 p.m engagement of temporary staff to ensure that affected customers are speedily attended to and are credited with approved compensation by October 7, 2022. Uh, that's October 7, 2022. Final resolution of the vending failure as soon as possible with minimum further uh, inconvenience to consumers. Yes, so watching, join us today. We'll take a quick break. We will return with business. Stay with us. Hello, good afternoon. Let's do business now with me, Beverly Broom. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources is enforcing the Joint Framework for action signed in 2017 with 36 cocoa and chocolate producing companies to halt deforestation and degradation of the forest in the cocoa value chain. This is under the Cocoa and Forest Initiative to ensure cocoa lands are not taking over for illegal mining activities. Speaking at the 2022 Orange Cocoa Day, the Sector Minister Samuel Abujinapo said the government is stepping up education and sensitization, adding traditional and local authorities, farmers and members of the local community to rally behind the government. Here's a report. Launching the 2022 Orange Cocoa Day, the Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo expressed disgust at people selling their cocoa farms to illegal miners without thinking about the long-term effect of their actions on the environment. He, however, said government is encouraging farmers to plant at least 18 trees per hectare in their cocoa farms. This program, together with other initiatives being implemented by Ghana Cocoa Board, he believes will contribute immensely to reducing the expansion of cocoa farmers into fr forest frontiers. There are several other initiatives being implemented by the government to address deforestation and forest degradation and contribute to global efforts at halting climate change, such as the Green Ghana Day, the Ghana Shared Landscape Emission Reduction Program, the Forest Initiative Program, the Ghana Landscape Restoration and Small Scale Mining Project, and the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program, through which we seek to reclaim degraded mine lands. Excellent, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is disheartening that while we are taking all these measures, People are selling their cocoa farms to illegal miners without thinking about the long-term effect of their actions on the environment. This is a matter we must deal with, which we are fully committed to, but we need the cooperation of all. 
We must step up education and sensitization and get everyone, traditional and local authorities, farmers and members of the local community to rally behind us. The climate crisis is reaching a tipping point and sustainability in the cocoa value chain from cultivation to consumption is crucial to our quest to fight climate change. We need our cocoa and we need our forests. The two are not mutually exclusive, but can sustainably coexist to support global climate action. The representative of the European Union, Celine Madsen, expressed worry about the largely poorly regulated cocoa farming and production of cocoa beans in Ghana. She is, however, confident the new regulation of the industry will reduce deforestation and forest degradation. To reduce deforestation and forest degradation, that is caused by European consumption and production, and consequently reduce carbon emission and biodiversity loss caused by the European Union. So the regulation applies not only to cocoa, as my ambassador said earlier, but six different commodities. So we have palm oil, we have soya, wood, coffee, beef, and then cocoa. Uh, sorry, yes. And of course, derived products including uh, chocolate. So that little graph here gives you an idea of the different commodities we looked into in order to select the one that produced the most uh, deforestation. Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa in the world. Well, government intends to leverage the current discovery of mineral resources, lithium, in parts of the country for the manufacturing of solar batteries. This is to help the country take advantage of the move towards renewable energy. Deputy Minister for Energy, Andrew Japamesa, hinted that this is part of the development agenda by the government towards energy transition. Japamesa was speaking at the Africa Energy Conference 2022, organized by the Business and Financial Times. The Africa Energy Conference 2022, under the theme, Africa's Energy Future, Achieving Competitiveness and Sustainability to Support the Continent's Development Ambitions, is an avenue for stakeholders to deliberate on opportunities in the energy transition journey. Ghana's discovery of lithium is said to present another opportunity for the country to produce renewable equipment for the African market. According to Deputy Energy Minister Andrew Ejapamesa, government plans to use the resources to support the manufacturing of solar batteries locally. The opportunity for industrial and commercial ventures into the renewable market has a potential for revenue generation, job creation, and energy security enhancement. Ghana's recent discovery of high-grade lithium is an achievement the government intends to leverage on in exploring the real possibility of manufacturing solar batteries locally. The naturally occurring sunshine has also become a commodity which African countries must position themselves to fully harness. Senior trade expert at the Continental Free Trade Secretariat, Diza Lumo, told the gathering that the energy market in Africa is ripe for investment opportunities. Increased industrial production means increased industrial electricity demand. The African continent's exports have averaged about 75% on processes, primary commodities, and solid mineral since 2007, and 40% of intra-Africa export are manufacturing commodities. Currently, around 70% of value addition of African commodity export occurs outside the continent. Increased intra-Africa trade will boost domestic manufacturing demand and demand for productive power as a result. Chief Executive for the Business and Financial Times, Dr. Godwin Akwe, explains that the conference has scaled up to cover the African region with the onset of the Continental Free Trade Agreement. We have more business when you log on to myjoyonline.com forward slash business. My name is Beverly Broom. Up next is sports with Muftar Nabila Abdullahi. Stay. Muftar Nabila Abdullahi here with sports on Joy News today. Black Stars psychologist at the 2006 FIFA World Cup, Dr. Yao, 
from Forja wants the Ghana Football Association to deal with all bonus issues that will arise in the lead up to the FIFA World Cup that will be staged in Qatar later this year in order not to derail the focus of the team, Ghana's participation in 2014 FIFA World Cup was marred by disagreements over appearance fees and bonuses, resulting in player revolt. Dr. Umfojo, who is Black Star's first psychologist, has been speaking in an exclusive interview with my colleague Nathaniel Atoll. United team work focus. I mean, somebody like uh, the current coach Utoado has been there. <laughs> he was part of the 2006. He's seen it all before in terms of so. Just focus, uh, you know, simple things, settle all the, whether it is, again, money is not, it's not even the amount of money, it's not, I mean, people make a whole big song and dance, but I mean, the kind of money that these players are, are paid, it's really a, it's a drop in the ocean, but it is also such that, you know, you, you settle everything because you don't want to have a situation where anybody's emotion is diverted from you know sure. what 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 they got to do i mean just a simple analogy look uh, you know when you got to eat your blood flow is diverted to your stomach <laughs> so if you got to play your blood flow is diverted to your legs your arms mm. whatever and if you got to get angry or whatever, blood flow goes to the brain and it's just, you know. So, exactly, yes. uh, so it's important to to simplify things by not not be diverted by unnecessary stuff. So sort out all the simple basic things and let the players focus on and the team and whatever focus on the work that they are there to do to deliver. That's all. To the Ghana Premier League, newly appointed head coach of Midiama FC, David Duncan, has urged fans of the club to be measured in their expectations for the 2022-2023 Ghana Premier League season, a campaign which has been halted due to legal issues and governing the Ghana Football Association. Yeah, I mean, I, I very much applaud, you know, and I appreciate so much, you know, the Allah for the club, you know, uh, how partisan they are, how passionate they are, you know, to stand behind the team, root behind the team and support the team through thick and thin, you understand? And I'm just hoping that um, it would be so throughout the season because, of course, I mean, I wouldn't promise them heaven, you know, but... Um, Play the game of football, you know, and the kind of results it chance out from time to time. I mean, they should just continue to root for the team. Like I'm saying, it's a marathon, so in a marathon, sometimes you can you can lag behind, you know. But at the end of the day, ultimately, what the situation ends up is what they should judge the team by. And of course, their input is going to be very much welcome, which is their support, unrelenting support, even when the going gets tough, you know, because the game is played 90 minutes plus, and anything can happen within that period of time. And it is at that point when the going gets tough you know, that will be needed most. That's your sports for now, but we do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com and also at 2 p.m. when we come your way to sports today, as well as Joy Sports World Cup Tales at 2.30 p.m. We have live commentary of the UEFA Champions League match between Chelsea and AC Milan on Joy 99.7 FM. I'm Muftar Nabila Abdullah. Thank <laughs> you.